Good morning and welcome to Lake Houston Church of Christ for our morning service. We thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you are visiting us via the broadcast, we thank you so much for joining us as well. And we pray that our service will be edifying, encouraging, and uplifting to you. We have several members of our church that have requested prayers on their behalf. We uh, ask that you will keep them in your prayers. We have members that have requested prayers for family members as well. And if you will please check the church website, there'll be updated information concerning all those who have requested prayers. We want to extend our sympathy to Sister Mary Mullins on the recent passing of her brother, Louis. We ask that you'll keep Mary and her family in your prayers as well. Before we have our opening prayer, I would like to share with you a verse from 2 Corinthians, uh, be uh, chapter one, and it'll be verse number three and four. And it reads as follows. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which our selves are comforted by God. If at this time you'll join me, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer and open up our morning services. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, God of all blessings and the giver of all grace, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains our life and for the food of this earth. We thank you for the creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, and for the ear that the ear may hear. We thank you for this day, for your promise to be with us, to be our God and to give us our salvation. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you through the technology that brings us together while physically we're apart. We pray for our nation, our leaders, world over, as difficult decisions are made. May our leaders turn to you for their guidance that would benefit each of us. We ask a blessing on all our families that have lost loved ones due to COVID-19, that peace will enter their hearts and comfort will sustain their lives in the days that lie ahead. Father, we are mindful of our brothers and sisters and family members that have requested prayers on their behalf we ask for your healing as you are the great physician. We pray for Sister Mary Mullins and her family in the recent passing of her brother, Louis. And now, Father, as we enter into this period of worship, we ask for your blessings on Kevin as he brings to us a lesson from your holy word. Be with each of us as we sing songs of praise to you, partake of the communion. For these and all the blessings, we give you thanks eternal and loving God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Number 990, you are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. Number 888. Number 888, thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song to praise Him all day. church. Uh, we've come to the point in our service where we would normally uh, take up a collection for the saints. Um, as we're worshiping from afar, you have a couple of options available to you. Uh, you can bring your contribution directly up to the building to the church office. Uh, you can also mail in your check. Um, we have envelopes here, pre-stamped envelopes if you'd like to use those. You're of course able to use your own envelopes um, if you see fit. Let's have a prayer for the contribution this morning. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your sovereignty in all things. Father, we thank you for the God that you are, even in trying times such as this. Father, we thank you for the ability that we have to make a living, Father, and to have physical blessings while upon this earth. Father, be with us as we purpose in our hearts to give generously, to give from a place of wanting to further your kingdom and to help others. Father, help us to give cheerfully as you would have us do. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Number 359. Number 359, Jesus keep me near the cross. Jesus keep me near the cross. There a precious Yeah. 
Good morning, church family. This morning, let each of us prepare ourselves to partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. As a child of God, every first day of the week, we observe the Lord's Supper. Communion with God is at the heart of Christianity. As believers in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we confess this truth at the time of our baptism into Him. We confess that He died for the remission of our sins. We celebrate the body and the blood sacrifice of Christ. All of us are members of one body. We all join together this morning signifying the brotherhood of believers. We are the body of Christ. We are His church. Therefore, I have a question for you this morning to ask yourself. Do I really want to go to heaven and spend eternity with the Lord? In partaking of the Lord's Supper in the right manner, we Christians proclaim the Lord's death till He comes, which means that we are hopefully looking forward to the eternal salvation we will receive at the return of Christ. The forgiveness of sins that was made possible by this sacrifice on Calvary is in vain unless the Lord comes again to receive unto Himself in heavenly glory those who are faithful to Him. How can we Christians partake of the Lord's Supper in the right manner? To remember the death of Christ for our redemption, who does not look forward to the eternal salvation involved in the second coming of Christ. No one then can possibly be prepared for the communion service who does not follow Paul's advice in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised together with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are upon this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested, then shall also with Him be manifested in glory. As a Christian, we must profess the responsibility of personal self-examination in preparing ourselves for the Lord's Supper. See if you have the proper qualifications this morning. Do you have knowledge to discern the Lord's body? Do you have true repentance for your sins, true faith in our Lord Jesus, a sincere desire to live the life of a Christian and to be like the Son of God and be saved by the merits of His blood? You must examine yourself and see whether you have the right feelings of a communicant and can approach the Lord's table in a proper manner. Our examination should be directed to the inquiry whether we are gaining the victory over our besetting sins and becoming more and more conformed to our Savior. Will you approach the Lord's table this morning with a life that is Christ-oriented, Christ-obedient, heaven-bound, with a prayerful, reverent, serious, loving, grateful attitude that concentrates that which the elements of the Lord's Supper symbolizes, to truly see in them the body and the blood given on Calvary to procure our redemption and to make possible for each of us to spend eternity in heaven with our blessed Savior. Great blessings are in store for each one of us in the Lord's Supper if we will prepare our lives, our souls, our hearts, and our minds for a proper partaking of this blessed feast. Let us remember the earnest plea of our Lord when He said, Do this in remembrance of me. Let's offer a prayer for the bread at this time. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your foresight and having a plan to redeem mankind from uh, its sinful state, Father. And Father, we are so thankful that your Son and yourself agreed before time that he would be the ultimate, perfect, beautiful sacrifice that would show us true love, that would bridge the gap between us and you. Father, we're thankful for the pain he was willing to endure. Father, we're thankful that he knew that his body would be completely broken and that the pain that he would endure would be unimaginable and the death that he would die would be that of a criminal. Father, we're thankful 
for his love and for his willingness to endure that for us. God, as we partake of this bread, which represents his body, help us to take it with humility, help us to take it with reverence, help us to take it with thanksgiving in our hearts. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's pray again. Again, God, we approach your throne, understanding that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Father, there was certainly shedding of blood on that day when your son gave up his life for us. Father, we understand that this is not the blood of, of bulls or goats, Father, but the blood of the Lamb of God that forgives us completely of our sins, Father, as long as we are walking in the light and living the life of a Christian. Father, help us to take this fruit of the vine this morning in the manner it was intended with reverence and humility and with great thanksgiving. It's in Christ name I pray, amen. Number 499, number 499, oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasure, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. morning is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. That is Revelation, chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. And I heard a, li a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, 
who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcome him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. Good morning, church. If you have a Bible or access to the scriptures, if you'll open to Revelation chapter 12, we'll be studying those verses in Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. You know, if you have lived in Houston for any length of time, you know that we've had our share of floods, hurricanes, uh, sometimes great flooding. And a lot of times we talk about those floods and those hurricanes in terms of property damage and, and the cost to physical things. But growing up, and I don't even remember which flood or which hurricane or what it was, but it, it's the story that I remember that I can't forget the the human story of a father who was caught in a flood. They had not ev evacuated in time, and this man had uh, two daughters. And as they were swept out of their house, he had hold of a daughter, one in each arm, an older daughter and a younger daughter. And, and as they were interviewing him afterwards uh, in the hospital as he was recovering, that uh, he had braced himself against a tree. And as he's holding these these two daughters. His arms started getting weaker and weaker and he couldn't pull against that current. It was the most heartbreaking story as this man relayed the thought process of which daughter do I let go of? I can't hold them both. And even as a teenager, I thought, how do you make that decision? How do you, how do you let go of two things that you don't want to let go of? How do you let go of one of those two things, one of those two daughters? And, and he talked about that decision, and he, he finally came to the decision that he would let go of the older daughter because he thought she had the greatest chance of survival, that the younger one would never survive. So he, he let go of the, the older daughter and, and held on to the younger daughter until rescuers came. And sadly, the older daughter died in that flood. And this father was mourning that decision. Could I have held on? Could I have, if I had just tried harder, if I just held on a little longer, could I have held on? Could I have repositioned myself against that tree? Could I have done something to hold on to both at the same time? Now, that motivation is pure. To want to hold on to two daughters that you love, to want to hold on to those children. But in God's word, we're very often called to hold on to one thing and let go of another. Not two equally good things but one that we should cling to and one that we should not. For example, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You can imagine the Christian who has hold of the world in one hand and, and the things of God in the other hand and tries to figure out how can I hold on to both. We talk about this, this paradox, this conflict. You cannot be a worldly Christian. You cannot be a world-loving Christian who also loves God. John makes it clear, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You can't hold on to both. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. So you imagine a Christian, and he's got one in each hand, and he's holding on to God with one hand, but he, he really loves his wealth on the other, and, and his, the things money can buy, and the things money has, has given him. And he's like, well, I want to be a Christian, but I also want to hold on to these physical things, and I don't want to let either one go. And the Bible tells us when you've got God in the world or God in money, you've got to turn one loose. In Revelation chapter 12, as we read about those during a time of great persecution, they had this love for God and his church in one hand and their, their own lives they were clinging to in the other. We're going to study this morning that they were willing to let go of their own lives, to cling to what really mattered. The Bible talks about they loved not their own lives. Revelation chapter 12 and 
Verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. I want to take just a moment this morning to start by looking at the lives they lived that they were willing to let go of. They lived lives of persecution and accusation. Acts chapter six tells us in verse eight, some of the first disciples, Stephen, a man full of the, the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Verse eight says, Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. You would think maybe they would just give up. It's a lot, a lot of people from different places coming in and, and they don't like what he's saying and they're opposed to him and the disciples lived lives of accusation and persecution and resistance and they, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So what did they do? Verse 11 says, Then they secretly instigated men who said, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up, not witnesses, but the Bible says they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against the holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So they, they couldn't withstand the wisdom of the Spirit and the things he was saying. So look what they did. They secretly instigated, they stirred up the people, and they set up false witnesses. If you can't beat someone straight up, then cheat. If you can't withstand an opponent, then just lie about them, correct? Why would they do that? If, if they really wanted to debate and argue, if they wanted to, to make accusations, why not make them real accusations. But in our reading in the text, if you noticed in Revelation 12 and verse 9, the great dragon, that ancient serpent, the deceiver of the whole world. The Bible says he's a liar and the father of lies, that the truth is not in him, that he can't speak the truth. And the same way that we serve a God who cannot lie, we are opposed by a devil who cannot tell the truth. He is the deceiver of the whole world, so it's not unusual that his followers would secretly instigate and stir up people and bring false witnesses. The Bible calls him Satan, the great dragon, the accuser of the brethren. Someone, it's what the word Satan means, the accuser, the adversary, the one who is in opposition to us. You know, it's unfortunate that sometimes we give the accuser, the truth he uses. Sometimes we give him things he can use against us. He doesn't have to rely on lies. They say some of the greatest lies are, are, are sown with truth. When we give someone ammunition to use against us in their accusations, we help them in their cause. It makes me think of a time when my children, when my children were very small and I had bought one of my kids a slingshot. And, and we were shooting at wasp nest and different things. And, and the park ranger drove up and said, you know, we, we've had a complaint against your kids that they're, they're shooting uh, acorns at some of the Canadian geese that are there on the lake. And I said, oh, no, 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 we're, we're just shooting at wasp nest and, and things like that. And they said, well, you know, we've, we, we need to look into this. And I, I called my child over with the slingshot and I said, please tell the ranger that you haven't been shooting at the geese. And from next to me, all I got was silence. And I looked down into the face of that child as he held that little slingshot. I said, Daddy, I, I was shooting acorns at the, at the geese. Now you shift into apology mode. 
Yeah. Now all of a sudden you're not, you, you, you've given the accusation some, some credence and some credibility and, and you realize what we do this with Satan. We have an adversary, an accuser who stands before God accusing us. And sometimes we play right into that by giving him ammunition to use against us. We stand guilty. We stand condemned. He doesn't just saunter to God, up to God and, and say, well, let's make an appointment for next week. The Bible says day and night before our God. Sometimes you hear people talking about working a double shift. You know, maybe they'll work two eights in a row or two tens in a row or, or, or twelves and, and work all the way through. But the Bible says this accuser of the brethren accuses day and night. Constantly before our God, constantly accusing the brethren. You can imagine having someone before God constantly telling him why you shouldn't be forgiven and what you've done wrong and why he shouldn't want you and why he should not love you anymore. But the Bible is good news. And this deceiver of the whole world, this great dragon, this accuser of the brethren, the Bible says, and the great dragon was thrown down. I would have liked to have seen that heavenly bouncer, that throwing down, that getting out. You, and the Bible says there's no place found for him in heaven. And, and, and to be thrown out of that place, that accuser thrown down. They lived lives of persecution and accusation. There were those men, those scribes and Pharisees who followed in the footsteps of the devil. But in heaven, that accuser is thrown out. He is thrown down out of that place that he wants to occupy. They not only lived lives of persecution and accusation, but lives of conflict and lives of war. You know, we talk about peacetime. Sometimes we talk about a peacetime dividend or, or serving during peacetime. We, we had a class one time in basic training where they looked at the history of the United States and they said, if you tried to fit a 20 year career Look how difficult it would have been to not serve during a time of conflict. Wars and rumors of wars the Bible talks about. And, and sometimes we tend to think locally and as long as we're not engaged in a war, but there are wars and conflicts all the time around the world. I don't know that there's been a time in modern history that some nation hasn't been engaged in war. Now, when we think of heaven and we see pictures or paintings of heaven, we tend to see very peaceful scenes, right? Angels with harps and long flowing hair and wings and spending their days singing and, and playing music. And we, we see those scenes and we see those pictures and there's always this lofty music playing and, and sunshine. But in Revelation, John paints a very different picture Chapter 12 and verse 7 says, now war arose in heaven. When's the last time you've seen a picture or a movie depict war in heaven? And it wasn't just any war. It wasn't a little minor skirmish. Michael, who's identified as an archangel, as a leader, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. Can you imagine what a scene that would make? I've told you before that the most common reaction to people seeing a single angel, one angel in Scripture, the most common response is what? Fear. They see an angel and they can't speak. They see an angel and they fall down as if dead. They see an angel and they fall down in an attempt to worship. One angel. Here's a scene of war in heaven with Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and his angels, the dragon fought back. But again, we have good news. The dragon and his angels fought back, verse eight says, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So not only is the accuser thrown down, the devil loses the war. The devil and his angels, he is not able to fight against the powers of God. So even though those on earth lived lives of conflict and war and, and saw it being part of that Roman Empire during this time and watching all of the conflict and the conquering, 
The Bible says that those in the church weren't the conquered, but the conquering. Verse 11 says, and they conquered him. They conquered him. But not on their own. It says they conquered him by the blood of the lamb. How do you defeat a dragon? How do you beat Satan? The Bible says they conquered him by the blood of the lamb. Ephesians tells us about this devil who is our enemy, who is against us, who is trying to take our life. And in Ephesians chapter six, it talks about putting on the armor of God. Verse 13 says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the belt, breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish. Your Bible does not say most or some or a few. It says all the flaming darts of the evil one. Even in some of those old war movies that is set way back in centuries ago, you'll see the archers as they line up and they'll ready their arrows and they'll let loose a rain of arrows. You know, sometimes men carried little shields they called bucklers, not very large. When a rain of arrows is coming down on your head and you have a little buckler that's used to deflect sword blows and things like that, you're not prepared for a rain of arrows. You may catch one or two with your shield, but you're gonna catch more with your body. So what did people do with the rise of archery? Well, the shields got bigger and the shields got better, but no shield of man compares to the shield of faith. The Bible says, take up the shield of faith in all circumstances that it can extinguish all the darts. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Not just darts, flaming darts. Not just arrows, arrows on fire. When you see those things coming in, when you know those things are coming, the Bible says, put your faith in God. Put your faith in Christ. We sing that song, the battle belongs to the Lord. And and there's a verse, the second verse says, when the power of darkness comes in like a flood... You imagine that torrent, that rush of water, when the power of darkness comes in like a flood. The battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. When it talks about raising a standard, it's another word for a flag, for a banner. He's raised up that standard. And sometimes when there were battles early in our nation's history, we would have a standard bearer. That's where that word comes from, the standard bearer, the one that would carry the flag. And as a kid, I used to think, you know, if if I were in one of those battles, I wouldn't want to be holding a flag. I would want to be holding a gun or a bayonet or a, or a sword or something. I, I would want something with which to fight, with which to defend myself, not, not just holding a flag. What can you do with the flag? But the standard was important. It became a rallying point. It became something that motivated people to continue. And when the flag would fall, it was considered a point of honor to drop even your weapon and pick up the standard and hold it high so that those who were fighting with you would know that the fight was on, that the standard was still raised. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, he's raised up a standard The power of his blood, the blood that cleanses us and washes us. When that time of conflict came, God stood up. Michael and the angels stood up against that war in heaven. And not only were they victorious, but the Bible says that that they conquered by the blood of the Lamb. Those in this world, those disciples, they lived lives of argument and debate. It wasn't easy. They didn't just go around proclaiming the good news and testifying about Christ. And everybody said, oh, we accept that. And that's wonderful. As they went along, they were met with argument and debate at every turn. You know, we had a teacher in high school who said, she gave us some topics and she said, write down what you believe about these things. Take a position. I wish we'd known what the assignment was going to be because the assignment was now you have to argue the opposite. 
You have to argue the opposite of your position and, and how difficult that was. But for the scribes and Pharisees, they weren't doing a school assignment. They weren't arguing the opposite of what they believed. They were arguing and debating against the truth. I always feel sorry for people who are speaking or performing or, or comedians when there are hecklers in the crowd. And they're trying to do their job and they're, they're trying to, to do what they should, but, but there's always someone in the, in the crowd who's giving them a hard time. Jesus and his disciples, almost everywhere they went, there was somebody there giving them a hard time, questioning them, questioning their authority, questioning the truth of what they were saying. And as the evidence mounted, some of them just doubled down, like those with Stephen. They couldn't withstand the spirit or the message, so they resorted to deceit. I love the account in John chapter 9. John chapter 9 says, Jesus passed by and saw a man blind from birth. And Jesus takes that opportunity to heal that blind man. He spits on the ground. He makes mud with his saliva. He anoints the man's eyes with mud and he says to him in verse seven, go washed in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who'd seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And this great confusion and consternation arises. And the Jews in verse 18 didn't believe that he'd been blind and had received his sight. So they call his parents and they ask him in verse 19, is this your son whom you say was born blind? How does he now see? And the parents said, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he sees we don't know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. But then unfortunately for the parents, the Bible gives us motive. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So they did. I'm impressed by the man. The man doesn't prevaricate. He doesn't dodge. He doesn't try to get out of this. He simply says to them, they, they want to know about this man. And, and he says, I've told you already in verse 27, and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you're his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. The testimony right before him. You don't know where he comes from, but you see that I can see. A man who'd been blind from birth, who had never seen in his life, now he sees, and they don't want to listen to the testimony. They want to find some way to make the truth not the truth. But in the face of this deceiver, this Satan, this, this dragon, who is nothing but a liar, the Bible tells us in that passage in Revelation chapter 12, not only did they conquer him by the blood of the lamb, but by the word of their testimony. The truth will prevail. The truth always prevails. Maybe in the short term, truth takes a beating, but in the long run, only truth can stand. Truth would conquer the lies of the deceiver. They lived lives of persecution and accusation, of conflict and war, of argument and debate and lives of great physical danger. Do you know it's a funny thing that there are those in this world today who teach that becoming a Christian is the way to have an easy life. Well, if you just become a Christian, everything will go well for you, and, and you'll have the money and the blessings and the health, and if you just have enough faith, everything will be easier and better. It is more truthful to say that when you become a Christian, you place a target on your back that the accuser now has someone to accuse, that the great deceiver has someone to lie about, someone that is no longer in his clutches. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35, some of the greatest faith ever seen on this earth. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. 
Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Why would you put up with that? Why would you deal with that? Why would you put up with all of the accusation and all of the persecution and all of the danger and the argument and the debate and the war and the torture and the mocking and the chains and the stoning and the being sawn into? Why would you put up with that? The Bible says so they might rise again to a better life. I've got this life on earth with all of its trouble and all the accusations and persecutions and all of the resistance and all of the things done against me and to me. And I've got this life in heaven and I can't hold on to both of them. I can't love the world and the things in the world and also love God. I can't love money and physical things and also serve my master. The Bible says of those faithful followers in Revelation 12, For they loved not their lives, even unto death. They did not love their lives. These lives on earth, the lives that they lived, they did not love them. They did not cling to them. They did not hold on to them. One of the things that made them conquer, that made them worthy, is they were able to let go. The man who let go of his daughter hoped that one day he would be able to hold on to her again. But for the Christian, it's letting go and letting go for good. Letting go forever. They loved not their own lives. It is not wrong to cling to what you love most. The question is, what do you love most? Do you love God? Do you love his church? Do you love his son? Do you love his spirit? Do you love those things that he tells us to cling to? Are you willing to let go of those things that he tells us to let go of? What do you love most? Whom do you love most? We know this from scripture. I know who loves you most. The one who not only said that he loves you, and the one who not only said, I love you, but the one who said, for God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. His son loved us enough to give up equality with God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but emptied himself. Became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He loved not his own life. Jesus didn't love the life he had so much that he was unwilling to give it up for you. And the question in scripture is, are you willing to do the same? Are you willing, instead of trying to be a worldly Christian and hold on to two things at once, are you willing to let go of that which you cannot keep? To hold on to that which will hold on to you in return. Do you believe in a God who loves you that much? And it's one thing to believe in him. The Bible says the demons also believe and tremble. When we believe in that God and we realize I need to change, I need to repent, I need to turn and let go of those things like Paul, like Peter in his denials, like those in in, in the first century who realize I need to quit living like that and I need to turn and live right. Are you willing to repent? Paul was repentant. Paul prayed. He didn't want to be the person he had been when he persecuted the church and drug them out of their homes and pursued them. There was a violent aggressor. But he was asked, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized. For what reason? And wash away your sins. To be cleansed, to be washed away. And the Bible has great promises that when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we repent of our sins, when we're buried in baptism, that God is faithful to forgive. That he will give us the gift of his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, that down payment, that earnest money, that seal upon us. That he'll add us to the body of Christ, not as slaves, but as children, as brothers, as part of his family. 
This morning's lesson as we look here and we see those who were faithful in spite of the, the wars in heaven and the persecution on earth and the accusations and the conflict and the argument and the debate and the trouble and the danger and the torture and the mocking and the chains, the Bible ends by telling us they did not love their own lives. May we as children of God today love the one who loves us even more than life itself. May we not cling to that which we cannot hold on to. May we not fear so much losing this that we don't think about losing home. In the times of this world with trouble, it's tempting to cling even to life itself to believe that the most important thing in this life is to live. That's not what we see in Scripture. In Scripture, the most important thing was not even to live, but to live eternally. Is that your focus today? Not to survive, but to live with God forever. May God bless us as we try to make sure that we hold on and let go of the things God has taught us to do. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Glad from the sunshine of love will I roam, far and far away. Calling, calling today, calling, calling today, today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling. church. We appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedule to worship with us today at the Lake Houston Church of Christ. We honor and worship our God and Father and His Son, Christ Jesus. We're excited about our future plans. Next Sunday, that's May 24th, we will begin a limited service here will be governed by CDC recommendations and social distancing. We pray for our country, pray for the families who've lost loved ones. Remember those of the Lake Houston congregation who are ill. You know, Jesus Christ loves and cares for us and guides us in our daily lives. Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 35 through 37, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword and even a viral pandemic? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, 
and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your love and care in our lives. We ask thy guidance in all that we do. We ask thy forgiveness of our shortcomings and sins. Help us to walk in your way. Help us to walk as you would have us in your will. Guide our loved ones. Keep them in your care. We praise you always. In your son's dear name we pray. Amen.